first. Completely unshocking news tonight that in January in the United States, which is located in the Northern Hemisphere, so it is therefore winter, a large swath of our country has been beset by a winter storm. This is not an end of the world storm. This is not a once in a lifetime storm. This is a storm. It's a winter storm. And in 2009, in the United States, in the most powerful nation and economy on the face of this earth, a winter storm means that there are more than a million people with no electrical power. From Oklahoma to Arkansas to Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, and everywhere in between, because there is a storm, wow, who could have seen that coming in January? The power is out in a lot of places. Our government justifies billions of dollars in homeland security spending in part on the threat that terrorists will hit a force multiplying target like our power grid and thereby paralyze a portion of this country and cause great inconvenience and maybe panic and maybe even economic shock. It is a reasonable concern. But what exactly is the protect the homeland defense against, I don't know, normal weather patterns for January? We've been attacked by the weather. The power grid is down. It's as if we are made of sugar. When it rains, we melt. When it snows, we melt and then freeze and then fall down on ourselves. Even President Obama cannot believe what happens in this country in bad weather. My children's school was canceled today uh, because of what? Ice. Some, <laughs> some ice? ice. <laughs> as, uh, Chicago. As, as, my, uh, as my children pointed out in Chicago, School is never canceled. <laughs> In fact, my seven-year-old pointed out that uh, you'd go outside for recess. <laughs> We're gonna have to try to apply some uh, plenty Chicago toughness to this town. <laughs> You know, personally divined regional flinty toughness is neat, but it probably will not fix the big embarrassing problem we've got as a country. Our infrastructure is broken. More than a million Americans are sitting in the cold and dark tonight because of the who could predict it miracle that is snow in January. The American Society of Civil Engineers issued a report today that estimates that we need to invest $2.2 trillion in our infrastructure over the next five years if we just want to bring our system essentially up to code. The engineers give our country's infrastructure a D. Our roads, a D minus. Our bridges, a C. Our rail, C minus. Drinking water, D minus. With a report card like that, it's clear that we're just not applying ourselves. Given that we haven't upgraded our nation's infrastructure in a meaningful way in about 50 years since President Reagan chose to skip scheduled maintenance, we are overdue. Meanwhile, there's that Great Depression sneaking up on us every single day. The post office wants to cut down delivery to five days a week to save money. Since Monday, since two days ago, 100,000 more Americans have lost their jobs. You know what infrastructure spending does? It puts people to work. Policy-wise, there is not really a serious debate here. The lucky thing that got its picture in the political science dictionary next to the entry for policy, comma, economic stimulus is infrastructure spending. It's a cute little light rail station under construction, smiling at the camera. But President Obama, while he talks a good pro-infrastructure game, he decided politically to try to get everybody to vote for his stimulus bill. And he decided that he was willing to make it a way worse bill to try to get that political outcome. He replaced a ton of spending plans with tax cuts to please Republicans. Republicans objected to family planning programs being part of the economic stimulus bill. And the president directed his fellow Democrats in, in Congress to take out the family planning programs. Apparently, it's crazy to think that we could improve poor people's financial situation and, giving, and give them more money to spend by helping them with family planning. Apparently, that's crazy talk. The truly vexing thing, as our infrastructure collapses under the weight of wintry mix all over the country, is that President Obama does not need Republican votes. With huge Democratic margins in the House and the Senate, the Democratic president could have steamrolled the stimulus bill he liked best. He didn't. He watered it down to chase Republican support. And after all of the watering down, including scaling back the infrastructure spending, tonight not a single Republican voted for the stimulus bill, not one. Of course, some of their constituents won't hear about that because they don't have any electricity tonight. Here's the bottom line. Postpartisanship is a very pleasing political idea. But the pursuit of postpartisanship left us with a lousy bill when we could have had a good one and no Republican votes to show for it. If Republicans are not going to vote for anything the Democrats put forward anyway, 
can't the Democrats just ignore the Republicans altogether now and do what's right policy-wise? And can I put in a special request for an electrical grid that works even in the snow? Joining us now is Congressman Pete DeFazio, who is a Democrat from Oregon. He's a member of the all-important House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Congressman DeFazio, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, first off, I have to congratulate you and a couple of other Democrats in the House today who got an amendment passed to the stimulus, an extra $3 billion in mass transit spending. How did that come about? Uh, actually, the leadership was listening. Uh, quite a few of us have been speaking out in the caucus over the last couple of weeks, uh, speaking up to the president's advisors the couple of times they showed up for a few minutes to listen to us. Uh, she heard it, and she insisted uh, at the last minute that that amendment be allowed and we get more money for transit. Uh, good for uh, the traveling public in urban areas. Uh, good for people uh, who will get jobs when we, uh, when we build that infrastructure, build the buses, build the rail cars. Uh, a, a nice addition to the bill, but nowhere near enough. I sense frustration from you in terms of your access, Democrats' access, to White House advisors to the president. Am I right to sense that? Yeah, last week uh, after we had one caucus kind of blow up over the issue, they said, well, President's advisors would come to the next uh, caucus. We had a special one that afternoon, but they only had 45 minutes before they had to go somewhere else, probably over to the Republican caucus. I don't know where they went. Are they spending more time with the Republicans than they are with their own party? Well, President didn't come to talk to us yesterday. You mentioned the last time that we spoke that the president's chief economic advisor, Larry Summers, uh, hated infrastructure, that he was not a pro-infrastructure guy, even though he had said some nice things about it of late. I wondered if the administration um, got in touch with you about that. You said that uh, when, when you said it on the show, you see, it seemed that you might suggest that you were making a little noise that might get a response. Did you? Um, actually, there seems to be a response coming, so I'm, I'm going to have some conversations with some folks downtown. Uh, maybe after tonight's vote, maybe that's a game changer. They didn't get a single Republican vote. Uh, what's this $300 billion of tax cuts about? We know the tax cuts don't work. We tried them with Bush. Uh, let's put that money into proven investment in the future of this country, uh, energy efficient uh, transportation, uh, you know, a new grid, as you talked about. That would be nice, a, a grid that can withstand uh, even a winter storm. <laughs> Um, because the House Republicans effectively took themselves out of this game tonight by, by having 100 percent no votes on it, I am assuming that the silver lining here to that vote is that when this moves on to uh, the Senate passing the bill and then we're looking at a, a final markup in a, in a conference committee before it goes to the president, is it a silver lining that, that we might end up with a better bill because Republican concerns are now no longer going to be considered? I, I really hope it's a game changer. Uh, either the Republicans come to their senses and support things that really put people back to work and rebuild this country, or on the Senate side uh, and in the conference, or the White House figures out that we've got the right formula uh, and they come, they come our way. I would encourage uh, all of your uh, viewers uh, and your listeners uh, to call uh, the Senate tomorrow, uh, to email the Senate, to call the White House, to email uh, the White House and let them know uh, where you stand. You've seen the polling by Frank Lunt's Republican pollster. There's overwhelming support for investment in infrastructure in this country. Even 71% of Republicans say they pay more taxes for it, let alone borrow money to do it. On, um, on, on that prospect, because I know whenever we talk about infrastructure on this show, the response from our viewers uh, is strong enough to indicate that people probably will call their senators tomorrow because you just suggested that. In terms of what to say, we know that the American Society of Civil Engineers, their report out today says we need to spend about $2.2 trillion on infrastructure to get us up to code over the course of the next five years. Um, they say we need 2.2 trillion in spending just in terms of what we need as a country. By comparison, so people know, how much infrastructure spending is in the stimulus bill that passed today? Uh, transportation infrastructure, about 43 million. Uh, and the most generous interpretation of infrastructure in this bill, uh, around 100 billion, which is a pretty small fraction of uh, a trillion. If you do not get the kind of investment in infrastructure you think this country needs out of the stimulus bill, if it doesn't get scale, dramatically scaled up in the Senate, if it doesn't get dramatically scaled up in the conference committee by the time President Obama actually signs something, are there other opportunities this year to go after it, or is this our big chance? 
Well, I'm worried that we're going to borrow so much money. Remember, every penny of this $825 billion is borrowed. Uh, how how big is our credit line out there with the world? I'm worried about that. And when it comes to the major surface transportation reauthorization later this year, the Water Resources Development Act reauthorization, the FAA reauthorization, uh, are they going to say, gee, we're sorry, we're out of money now. Uh, we kind of blew it on that first package. So uh, I have concerns, but we do have more opportunities pending later in the year, major bills uh, that we are going to move out of our committee and through the Congress uh, that could invest more in our infrastructure. Congressman Pete DeFazio of Oregon, thanks for your leadership on this issue. Thanks for coming on the show tonight. If I got you in trouble, I apologize in advance. <laughs> Not at all. I think we're both troublemakers, and that's what you got to do sometimes <laughs> to get the right thing done. That's probably why we get along. <laughs> thanks, Pete. Nice to see you. Thank you.